welcome today and for sitting with us and I know you've agreed to answer a few questions. Uh, tell me about the book and, and why did you write it? All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for the welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Why did I write the book? I felt that it was time. And that's why I entitled it This Medium's Life. This is my story. Uh, it's not the story of a medium. This is the story of this medium. And I really wanted to share my spiritual journey and how I feel about certain things and how I came to be uh, where I am today. I've been a medium now for 40 years almost, and of course a spiritualist. And I thought it is timely. Can you talk a little bit about your growing up in a poor family in Montreal and you were an altar boy and if you can elaborate on that a bit? Yes, uh, I was born in a place in Montreal called Griffintown. Um, Griffintown is a, was a mixture, it still exists but it's practically all demolished now and it's become sort of nouveau riche. Uh, when I was a kid we were poor. We were poor but we were happy so Griffintown was a mixture of Irish, Italian, French, Canadian uh, families that lived together. Um, sometimes we fought, most of the time it was in harmony. Um, you could liken it to Brooklyn, New York, because it was the same kind of energy. And it was, you had to be tough to grow up in that area. And uh, I was an altar boy for about 10 years, since the time that I was seven until I was 17. I was, um, I was in love with the church. I really enjoyed being an altar boy because I enjoyed the ritual. Um, I was very religious, um, still am to a certain extent, but in a different way. And that was my life. I had hopes of becoming a, a brother, actually, until I found out when I was about 14 or so that I was gay. And um, I realized then that the church had no place for me because of who I was. Um, so I left the church on my own accord. Uh, I think that's very important for me to, to know because I really, in my heart, was in love with the church. And I sincerely wanted to serve God in that manner. But I felt my integrity would be out. I knew at that age that the two would not blend for me. That was my choice. So um, it was a struggle for me because for many years, um, 14 onwards when I started to, to grow up, hopefully, and realized that I was different. And in those days, this was, uh, I was born in 1940, so you're talking about the 50s. Um, you know, the, the famous phrase that uh, was coined by Lord Alfred Douglas used the phrase, love that dare not speak its name. And that's exactly what it was like to be gay in the 50s. We weren't as um, savvy as the kids are in, in this day and age. So sex, we didn't know really what sex was. I really didn't. So I didn't have any sexual encounters with anyone. And of course, being a Catholic and being in the church, you had to keep yourself pure because that was a big, big deal in the Catholic church. You couldn't commit any sins of impurity, either thought, word, or deed. And uh, because of that, I was, it was quite a dilemma for me uh, because I had to struggle within myself to find out who I was and there was a lot of times when I started beginning to realize that I was different and and yet it wasn't right and in those days you know you would be called a queer or a pansy or whatever it didn't matter um, but you didn't want to tell people that because that was something to be ashamed of it was nothing to be proud of and in an area like Griffintown where you had to be tough, you'd have your block knocked off by somebody if they knew that. So you had to live, you, you, you learn to live in the shadows at 14 years of age. It sounds kind of crazy, but that's what it is. And so you had to, for me personally, to establish my own communication and question in my childlike mind in a way, because I wasn't yet mature, but I, had an, I was not stupid. But I had to question, well, why, why did God make me like this? And that was the struggle that I went on with for many years. The saving grace for me in Griffintown, growing up as an altar boy, because I loved it. And I was mischievous, as all altar boys were. 
and I can tell you about that later, but the saving grace for me that there was a wonderful priest in St. Anne's Church, and that was the church, the parish church, was St. Anne's run by the Redemptorist Fathers. There was a wonderful priest called Father Carney, Francis Carney, who was, had been a chaplain in the Navy. Now, Father Carney uh, was loved by everyone, and he called everybody honey. That was everyone's nickname. But when you went to confession to Father Carney, it was always a treat because he wasn't this big disciplinarian and he wasn't going to give you uh, penance to say 35 Hail Marys and 18 Stations of the Cross for being a bad boy. But of course, like all kids, uh, I remember going to confession and you had to think of things, what to make up. Because what are you gonna say? I had seven sisters, I pulled my sister's hair, um, I got mad at my mother, uh, I swore. I mean, so I would sit and think of things, I, or I had bad thoughts, Father. Eventually, um, I started speaking to him about my sexuality or had, you know, and he'd ask you what nature and I would tell him. He never criticized me or judged me. And at the end of confession, he would always say, now listen, Joe, they weren't supposed to know your name, but he always did. And he'd say, tell your mother that I'm going to exchange you for three kittens and two puppy dogs. So you go home and tell your mother that. And then he would give you, you know, go out and say to our Father and a Hail Mary, and that's it. So for years, I used to serve Father Carney's Masses. I loved him. He was a wonderful man. And um, say when he passed away, I stopped going to the church. And that was, I was about 17 then. He died a few years later, but um, I had to come to my own grips with that. Are you still as mischievous as you were as an altar boy? Well, I'd have to say yes, <laughs> of course. Um, we did terrible things. Well, we, th they, we thought they were funny. As kids, what did you do? You would laugh. There was a, a singer in the choir who was a soprano, and every church, I presume, had, and she was a rather large lady, rather obese, so we used to call her the fat lady. And of course, she would be singing at the High Mass on Palm Sunday, and we would go into fits of laughter. Then the nuns always sat in the first row in the church. All the first pews were the the nuns, and there was a young nun there that we used to call Hawkeye because she used to watch my friend Francis and I get up to our antics. So we would sit with our soutans and we'd pull up, roll up our legs and, and do this sort of thing. We'd roll our legs out for the nuns. Um, when mass was going on, if we had a new altar boy, we were in our glory because we would tell him, don't worry, we're gonna tell you when to ring the bells. Of course, you rang the bells at the, at the moment of the sanctus or the consecration. But of course, we would have them ring the bells during the gospel. We would say, ring the bells, ring the bells. And of course, the priest would turn around and give us a dirty look, and the poor kid would be ringing the bells, and all hell would break loose, pardon the pun, but it was very, very funny. Um, we did several things like that. We were always up to something. Um, but being an altar boy was a lot of fun. We were kids, we were innocent. And so we, we turned our, our whole life was the church. I mean, we would be there at eight o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night. So that's how I grew. I was very attached to the church. And, I, and I'll, I will state right now categorically that nothing on Thward ever happened to me as an altar boy. So I wanna bring that up right now uh, because often when people, when you mention you were an altar boy, people's eyes get big and they think, oh well, there's some dirt coming along here. Well. I don't have that story. That is not my tale, and that never happened to me. I was very happy in the church, and again, I left because I felt, well, there's no place for me here. Um, being as religious as I was, because I was really sincere uh, in my devotions, and we learned how to, to make sacrifices. We were told that, you know, like the Irish, you had to offer everything up to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So you would do penance. Um, you, I used to, to, na uh, to kneel with, uh, I had a habit that belonged almost like the Redemptorist. The brothers gave it to me. So my habit was different. I had a cincture, which I knew that you wore the cincture for purity because the church has all its rubrics and, and rituals. And I used to kneel with, and, and stick the pin in my side because the mortification of the body was a way to get closer to God. I mean, I did all those things. Um, because I really, that was my desire. So when I left the church, I was lost. And, you know, there was many a times that I prayed, uh, why am I like this? Uh, why did you do this to me? Give me a sign. 
give me a sign. I think that's everybody's prayer probably when you're dealing with a problem. We're all looking for signs. I think that we all saw too many Charlton Heston movies when we were kids. So it was like, give me a sign. Of course, there was no sign coming or forthcoming. And I would drop into uh, our church and to other little churches in the city sometimes to talk to God. And that was my prayer all the time. Change me, make me different. Um, I didn't know, why did you do this to me? So finally, when I was 17, I'd had enough. And then I thought, fine, you did this to me. Thank you very much. I'm turning my back on you. You turned your back on me. And I just totally stopped believing in God. That was it. And that went on for almost 10 years. In the meantime, then I sort of found my way up to the, uh, Montreal is a small city comparatively, up to the, the gay area of the city and, and uh, started becoming aware of gay society and, and meeting all these different kinds of people. I mean, uh, meeting characters and personalities, not, I wasn't promiscuous and I wasn't running around. I never did that. But it was very hard for me because I felt that I was just cut off and I had to deal with this because it wasn't a thing to be. And I brought it up in my book. Uh, this is not a gay book. And that's not the reason why I wrote the book. But I did want to address the issue because it's important. It, it's who I am. And after all these years, and, and, and the years of struggle, until I found my way into spiritualism, and, and I had this uneasiness in my stomach. I was, my stomach was always churning. I was nervous. I was unhappy. Um, I would brood about this stuff, and this was my big secret. I had to keep it to myself. Nobody could know, because people would look at you, and they would know that you were gay, or, and that wasn't right. And, and so, you know, you wouldn't wear a red shirt, because people would think that you were queer. It was just really, really horrendous. And, and my heart goes out these days to these young kids who are 12 and 13 and 15 who are taking their own lives because of being bullied. Uh, it's hard to believe in 2012 and 2011 that this stuff is still going on. Uh, I know that the movement has made strides, uh, but there's a long way to go yet. The people need to understand that being gay is not a choice. That is the way people are. Either you are or you're not. It's, that's it. And you cannot change your nature. So for me, what the challenge was then to fit my spirituality into my sexuality. We're sexual and spiritual beings. And so to, to make that compromise within myself and find out how can I come to a, a happy medium, pardon the pun, um, to find out who I am and, and, and love the creator as well. And it took me a while to get there, but I got there. But I really did it on my own. I really, really did it on my own. Um, being raised a Catholic, I think, for me, and having the discipline of the church and the structure, in a way, uh, was easier for me to become a spiritualist because I believed in the angels. I believed in the saints. I knew about those things. We, we were taught to imitate the saints and to imitate their lives. And so um, another world, to me, was completely made total sense. So I already think in a way, I mean, God had his plan for me. And, uh, but you don't know this until you're in it. And so you have to figure it out on your own. It's an inevitable journey, but it's one that you have to take I think on the spiritual path, you journey alone. You meet travelers along the way, but you really journey alone. And I had to find my own way, and I did. But it was interesting for me. It was a struggle, it wasn't easy. Joy, I have to ask, um, how did it come about uh, as an altar boy that you had the privilege of serving mass to Mother Teresa? Okay, that happened in 1954. Um, I was 14, and one morning, Brother Andrew, who was the brother of Sacristan in charge of the church, came to me and said, Joe, we need you uh, to serve a Mass uh, for the nuns on Murray Street. Murray Street was two streets over from St. Anne's Church. It was where my grandmother lived, 
and Granny lived in this courtyard, which was in in when it rained was a like a mudslide. Uh, there was a poor neighborhood, and the flats were like square. It was like this way here, and it so happened that this order of nuns, the little sisters of the poor, if I recall, uh, the little sisters of the poor um, came to Griffintown and they bought two flats, which were directly in front of my grandmother's house. And they fixed them all up and the neighbors were all enthused about it and curious and these were the nuns that were moving in. Some of them spoke French, some of them were spoke English and they were all dressed in white with uh, the white habits and the blue fringes on the end. And one day we heard, and when the, when the convent was ready, the house was ready, because they would live amongst the poor and, and do service for the poor. Uh, Brother Andrew told me that the head nun was coming from India to open up the convent. So would you go and serve mass for the nuns over on Murray Street tomorrow morning? And I said, yeah. And, um, of course, I knew exactly where it was, so I went over with the priest. Now, in my mind, I had never seen a person from India. Um, we didn't have many Indian immigrants in Montreal at that time, so I didn't know what to expect. I expected some woman, the head nun, to be wearing a sari, and that she would be like an Indian. So that's what I was looking for. And so when we got there, uh, our priest, uh, I served Mass, the priest said in the Mass, and at the end of the Mass, the nuns invited us to have tea. And then the Mother Superior, who turned out to be this small little lady, not much taller than my grandmother, and, and Granny was about probably four foot something, nine or something, and uh, with olive skin. And she was the Mother Superior, and she spoke with an accent, I remember that. And uh, she thanked us for coming, and so on and so forth. She was very nice. I was disappointed because I expected the sari, but here she was, this wee little thing in her white habit, and she was the head nun. It only dawned on me when I began to write this book, and that was like two years ago. I was writing out this story, I remembered the story, and I thought, oh my God, that was Mother Teresa. She was the head of that order, and she did come from India to, to open up this convent. So I served Master Mother Teresa without really knowing it. So I just thought it was just kind of interesting. That's a great story. Well, it, it gave me, uh, huh, it's kind of nice. Can you explain to me what is a medium in your own words? Yeah, a medium is a person, um, let me call it this way, a person with HSP, higher sense perception. So a medium is someone who is able to tune in to vibrations around them uh, particularly mediums deal with spirit. Um, there's a difference between a, a psychic and a medium because that probably would be your next question. Uh, exactly, so yes. a medium is a person who deals with spirit, who is aware of spirit, aware of working with spirit. So a person could be psychic and not necessarily be a medium. Uh, just having uh, psychic, they ha for people have intuition, they can sense things. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that people use that talent. A medium specifically will deal with their spirit guides. They know who they are. And a medium's job, really, hopefully, is to bring uh, to people, to bring comfort the bereaved, um, to act as a go-between between this world and the next in the sense that, uh, you know, people don't come to see me when they're happy most of the time. They come to see you sometimes because they have a lot of stuff going on or they've lost a loved one and hopefully they're trying to make contact. Most of the time it would work, but nobody can guarantee that they can uh, tune into the spirit world and say, fine, you want to talk to your father or your Uncle Joe and here they are, because you never know. You cannot compel a spirit to come. Joey. Does the medium have to be spiritual? Not necessarily. However, there's always a however. It does help if the medium uh, who's dealing with spirit is spiritually aware because the law of spirit is a law of attraction and you will attract the type of entity to yourself on the level that you are. So um, some people can be mediums without knowing it. 
and they, they're able to see spirits and so on and so forth, but they don't know what to do with it. So you really uh, should be trained and you really need to work on your own inner, it's an inside job, so you really need to work on your own inner life uh, to help you if you're developing along those lines. Because in the spirit world, you have to remember that the personality does not change after death. So you're dealing with all types of entities. And if you're not on a certain level, a uh, certain spiritual level, you may not be able to handle some of the people that come through because you won't know what to do with them. The spirits I'm talking about. This is a silly question, but do the spirits take over your life? <laughs> That's not silly. Uh, absolutely not. But I want to be really clear on that. The spirits do not take over your life. And if you're a properly trained medium, that would never, never happen. You make the agreement with spirit that you are going to serve, that you're going to help people, and you're going to be an instrument for them. And so they don't take over your life. There's a certain time when you're doing it. You know, I happen to be a person that happens to be a medium, not the other way around. I'm not a medium that happens to be a person. So I'm in control of my own life. And absolutely, spirit can guide you, um, but they will never interfere in your life and they do not take over your life. Uh, to, just to add further to that question, I, I saw a documentary and uh, there was a psychic there or, or whatever and her comment was, I can't control the spirits, I never know when it's going to happen and I don't know what to do about them. Well, that is total rubbish. So what you need to do is go back and be trained because the, it does not work that way. If you're trained in the development class properly, spirit will know the rules. So they do not take over your life. I want to be very, very clear on that because it's something that you need to um, absolutely be sure of. How do you know when a spirit is around? I mean, can you hear them or feel them or? Well, most mediums are clairvoyant. And clairvoyance means, comes from the French word, clairvoyance, the ability to see, clear seeing. So often you will see a spirit. Now, having said that, I'd like to remind people that, and as I said before, and this is in my opinion, I'm speaking from my own experience, spirit often shows themselves as a tiny speck of light. Ping, and you could see that around people at times. Um, and that is a spirit light. That's one way that they show themselves. In other ways they manifest, it's telepathically. They actually, I mean, I actually see spirits subjectively. I can, um, and I see them often in the middle of the night when I'm dead asleep and I just awake and there's someone standing at the edge of my bed or at the side of my bed looking at me. And I have seen a lot of people, my relatives, uh, friends that have passed over, um, that they, they appear to me to let me know that they're okay. So you see them, you actually see them. Also, you can tell when spirits are around just by the energy shift. A medium is sensitive to the vibrations around them. So if that is their job and spirit knows that, well, they will do their best to attract your attention. So it's being sensitive and being aware to the vibration of spirit. Um, in everyday life with people, there's some people that we meet we like them right away. There's some other people that really turn us off because we don't like their energy. And it's all about energy. And we'll say, well, we don't like their vibes. And sometimes one could be standing in a, a, a line in a store and somebody comes and stands beside you and you just want to move away because you just don't like their energy. There's something about them. It's the same thing. It's like spirit. Remember that the personality does not change with a change called death. So spirits retain their personality and their energy. So, Joey, being a medium or mediumship, is that something you're born with? Can you develop it? I mean, where does it come from? Mediumship, I like to say, um, in my experience, that mediums are born and not made. Either you have the, the gift, the faculty, or you don't. Nobody can make you a medium. 
you know, you can't learn how to be medium in 10 easy lessons. But if you have the intuitive ability that you're born with it, some people, we've all heard about people being born in the old country, especially the Irish and the Scots, who are natural mediums, many of them, because they live near water. Water is a conductor of energy, by the way. But we've also heard that the people are born with a cowl, the veil over their face, and they'll say that they have the sight. And it's as common as, you know, as history itself. And so uh, people, mediums are born, and they can be trained, and, and you can work on the gift, and it can be developed. It needs to be done in a development class. That's with a trained medium and someone who can perceive spirits and who knows how to properly train the spirits to come into your vibration so that you are taken care of, and it's a two-way street between the medium and the spirit entity manifesting. You mentioned in the book about joining the spiritualist church to help you find questions in your life or mm -hmm. to answer questions yes. in your life. What is a spiritualist? Well, a spiritualist is, spiritual, first of all, spiritualism um, is a philosophy of life. It's a way of life. There's no dogmas or creeds in spiritualism. I consider myself a spiritualist. Um, but they do have principles, and I can rhyme them off for you very quickly. Fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, uh, the continuous existence of the human soul, personal responsibility, which to my mind is the most important, uh, eternal progression open to every human soul, and the communication of spirits and, and of angels. That's what spiritualists believe, as simple as that. And what you learn to do, um, when I first went to the spiritualist church now, there's not that many of them around, and they don't, they're not usually in huge buildings over here in America. In Britain, uh, they have actually churches that are real church edifices and so on and so forth. And they have services and so on, you know, and that's where I got my training. I first went to the spiritualist church and I uh, the first time that I went into a spiritualist church it was a hoot because of course they were all Protestants and to me hey I was raised a Catholic and so I would go and they started reading the Bible and I was getting uncomfortable because I thought and then they started singing all these hymns that I didn't know but I used to just sit in the back of the church and watch what was going on because part of the spiritualist service is that someone does a talk and then the medium gets up and does what they call messages. They bring communication from spirit, and not necessarily all the time, but they do, that's their job. And so they give messages to people and I was listening. I'm a Scorpio, I don't trust anybody, never did. So I wanted to see what was going on and I was very curious and uh, I would listen to what people were saying. I never got a message myself, but I just, thought, this is kind of cool. Um, in the meantime, I had met a friend of mine um, who turned out to be my first spiritualist teacher. And I always give her credit because this lady was of the Jewish faith. She was a daughter of a rabbi who became a Baha'i and who read palms and read the cards. She didn't know anything about spiritualism, but we used to talk about spiritual things. And then Millie and I just really hit it off. And I'd go and visit her and we would talk over tea and she'd read my tea leaves and all this kind of stuff. So I was sort of interested in this stuff. I didn't know if I had any talent of my own. I never wanted to be a medium. That was the furthest thing from my mind. And um, so I started going to a little church on Guy Street in Montreal. And um, I joined what they call a development class. And I sat there for seven years like a block of wood, like a dunce. But something was going on. But I felt nothing, heard nothing, saw nothing. Everybody else in the class, they were all developing. They were getting impressions and messages and so on and so forth. But I was gaining something. I was gaining peace of soul, which I'd never had. I started slowly making peace with God, slowly accepting who I was with my sexuality and so on and so forth because that was still a big number for me. And I had to try and fathom what was happening to me. And then eventually I started developing myself. I actually um, could feel spirit working behind me and I could feel this energy coming into me. 
And that's how I first developed. And I actually started as a speaker. And I worked in what we, I was an inspirational speaker. I worked in what they call control, in spiritual jargon, in the spiritualist church. That means that it's a semi-trance state where an entity would come and impress you. And I could start off, uh, let's say, my favorite verse I used to start off with would be, consider the lilies of the field. I knew that much from the Bible. Because as Catholics, we did not study the Bible. We did not study, we had Bible history, but we weren't. Bible this and Bible that. And so uh, it was different for me. So I would just start off with that and then I would just start talking and then the words started to flow. So for the first few years, um, and this was after seven years, by the way, um, I was in my 30s by then, that I was actually a speaker and I would speak inspirationally, which I still do. But now um, when I speak, I like to know what I'm saying. And uh, so I don't work in that mode. Um, I'd, I'd like to be responsible for my own words and for what comes out of my mouth. Just to go back, for some of us who don't know what is a spirit, you talk about the spirit <sighs> taking over and coming. What is a spirit? Well, it ain't a spook, that's for sure. We are all spirits. You're a spirit, I'm a spirit. We are spirits with a body, having a human experience. We all are spirit. That is the essence of who we are. We are spiritual beings. And whether we understand that or know that, uh, that's who we are. And so we're all spirits in a sense. So that's what a spirit is. We are spirits. In other words, people talk about their soul. It's their spirit. Can everyone see spirits in, in a and how would they come to someone? Not everybody can see spirits, no. But spirit can appear uh, to whomever. You, you know, people have their own experiences. The good thing now, these days, I believe, along with everything else, that spiritualism and psychic phenomena, all these television shows that you have all over the place and all, it's, uh, it's come out of the closet in the last 10 years. So people now are more accepting of it. The, the whole thing that I always tell people about when you're dealing on the spiritual level with spirits. First of all, spirits are nothing to mess with. But I will talk about that in a second. But people can have spontaneous ex experiences of people who have passed on. They see their loved ones appear to them after they've died. Or they go somewhere and they see a spirit or they have an experience that it's, it's unaccountable for. It's, it's, it's a common thing. So it is your belief that, that when we all die, we become a spirit? Absolutely. Well, we're spirits now in the process of living. Uh, yes, it is my belief. That is what I believe. Um, and we go into the spirit world. We leave this body. This body, as far as I'm concerned, is the covering of the spirit that is within. And the, the spirit within is the essence of who we are. And, and that, as they say, is that, as far as I'm concerned. Joey, apart from your book being introspective and insightful, you talk a lot about spirit guides and materialization and, and many other aspects. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll do it quickly. Um, spirit guides are benevolent spiritual beings who work with mediums in a sense that uh, you could refer to spirit guides sometimes as guardian angels as well. Uh, materialization uh, there are actually materialization seances where it takes a physical medium. There's different types of medium. I'm a mental medium. That means that I work mentally. I work uh, telepathically and so on and so forth. Physical mediums are, are people who have the ability uh, through the energy in their body for, for the spirits to make um, physical manifestations. And a materialization, which I wrote about in the book, so it's, it's hard to go into it in great length, but the thing is that you have a materialized, materialization seance where the medium is in trance uh, and by the energy, it's called ectoplasm, this energy that comes from their, their body, they're able to build up a spirit. And the spirit will actually come through you. And I've had experiences where I've been standing in the middle of the room, like 20 or 30 people around, and I've had a spirit walk right through me and tell me, all right, I'm standing in front of you now just to prove that this is real 
I'm going to walk right through you and then come back and stand in front of you. And that actually happened to me. And what happens is spirits actually dissolve into the floor. It's a, there's not that many materialization mediums around now. But apparently from what I hear, uh, it is coming back that people are developing it. So that's really good because that, to me, is the ultimate proof of survival, if it's real. One of the chapters I really enjoyed was the ghost of Chung. Yes. At, that, about a ghost that was at a, a local Montreal radio station. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was very chilling when I read it. Yeah. Well, this is, the ghost of Chom was quite famous in Montreal. And Chom is a rock station. And uh, what happened is that, that I was called in by the manager, um, called me up at work. I worked for Eastern Airlines at the time. And uh, I always had a job, by the way. I always kept a day job. And my spook work, as I call it, my spiritual work, I did, you know, I did it all the time because it is my real work. But I got this call from a woman called Joanne Rudy and said, Joey, we need you to come and exercise a ghost. And I thought, this is a radio station calling. This is crazy. Um, I wasn't going to do it, but then I checked her out and so on and so forth. And uh, I decided to do it with two friends of mine. Uh, the story is that um, this gentleman and his wife lived in a house on Green Avenue in Montreal in Westmount. Um, they have internal problems within their marriage. Whatever happened, um, the man did himself in. And so the house was up for sale. Eventually, the radio station bought it. And then all kinds of things, formal hauntings took place. Uh, and the funny part was that this was a rock station, so half of the staff were on smoking pot most of the time. And so no wonder they were seeing things, but they actually did see them. They could see the man walking up and down the stairs. They put mirrors on the wall. Joanne had to replace a mirror about five or six times. It would crack. They put a cross on the wall. It, it fell off the wall. Um, the dis disc jockey would be in his booth playing music and he would get up and leave the room and somebody would lock the door. This is like at three o'clock in the morning and the guy couldn't get back in his room. So it took on a um, scene of formal hauntings. Anyway, to make a long story short, we did what we call a rescue circle. We helped him and he moved on. But the story is in the book and it's, it's um, interesting and it's true. Where do you think we go when we die? Well, I could quote uh, Mark Twain and say, uh, where we go um, in the hereafter depends what we go after here. Um, we go to the spirit world, which is another plane of existence. And there's different levels of the spirit world. So that is where the spirit goes. You, when you die, again, in my belief, we are spirits with a body. And the spirit leaves the body normally through the top of the head and goes into the spirit world, uh, where they're met and they're sent to what I call the Garden of Rest. And um, people come back and tell you when you're doing readings uh, how they're doing and, 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 and talk about the spirit world and what goes on for them. So uh, we go to another place. This is not all there is. There's something in the hereafter. That is my belief. Joey, what do you say to people who don't believe any of this? Hey. This is a free country. They can believe what they want. I really don't care. I really do not care whether they believe me or not. I, uh, first of all, I've written my book from my own experiences. These things have all happened to me. This is my reality. This is real for me. And I've had enough evidence for myself and have dealt with enough people through the years to know that spirit does exist, that this is not all there is but people are entitled to believe whatever they want. I really don't care. I'm not out to look for converts. So that's my answer in plain, simple English. Do you think that our loved ones see us here on Earth? I mean, do they see me cooking in the kitchen or driving? Or? Well, they may if you can cook. I don't know. Um, they're around. The spirit are around. They do. They do come back because I've done enough readings and uh, what I suggest in the book, there is some really, there's a chapter called Spirit Talks and they're very evidential readings that are given and, and they were all taped and it, and it shows you the personalities and how aware that they are of what's going on with their loved ones. So yes, they are, to answer your question. They're, they're not constantly watching everything that you do. 
but they are around. But it's a very hard thing because we, as human beings in our own reality, um, you know, we don't think about that all the time. But love lives on. The love lives on in the spirit world, and that cannot be destroyed. Can they also harm us? Uh, there are malicious spirits, um, just as there are malicious people. And yes, and, and spirits are nothing to trifle with, so you have to know what you're doing. And while I'm on that subject, I want to adamantly state right now, please do not play with Ouija boards because it is not a game and they work. And the law of spirits is a law of attraction, so if you don't know what you're doing, don't fool around with this stuff because it's nothing to fool around with. You can get into trouble. And that's, you know, it's a whole nother story about possession and obsession, but this stuff is true, it does happen. So there are uh, spirits who are not that nice, who are just as there are human beings, because they're still human beings in a different body, in a spirit body. Joey, in your opinion, what do you think are some of the misconceptions about mediums? Oh, probably that mediums are turned on all the time and they're always tuned in and that they look at people and they can see everything. That is not how it works. Mediums are normal, everyday people. And just because you're aware of spirit and you work on that level doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with the everyday problems of living on Earth. You know, um, no, people are, mediums are ordinary people with an extraordinary gift. There you have it. Um, but they live everyday lives like everybody else and they have problems like everybody else and they're not any more aware or any better than anybody else. They just happen to have a faculty that they can use if they choose to serve and make a difference in the world for other people. They can use their talent for good or for ill. But the choice is theirs. And do you believe in reincarnation? Absolutely. I never used to, but I had an experience. So it's a story. I'll tell it very quickly. Um, I was at a funeral service for a dear friend who had passed away, um, and his wife worked with, with me. I was kneeling beside a dear friend of mine, Gloria Gary. We were in a little church, uh, like a chapel in St. Marc, Quebec, which is a country. And the same instant in, during the Mass, Gloria and I looked at each other and we both had monk's habits on. It was just like that. It was like we both saw it. We saw each other. And I thought that was really cool. So yes, I do believe in reincarnation. Would you be kind enough to explain karma to the novice? Karma is the law of cause and effect. So as you sow, so shall you reap. The more spiritually aware you are, the quicker the karma um, acts or reacts. So whatever you do, karma is you're building, you're building things in your spiritual bank book in a sense, uh, which I believe we all have. But karma is basically the law of cause and effect. So as you sow, so shall you reap. Being a medium, what do you think are, are the qualities that one should have to be a good medium? First of all, the talent, the faculty to be able to do it, the willingness to do the work, humility, a desire to serve, honesty, and trust. Probably the most important, to learn how to trust spirit, trust your intuition, and trust your guides. And what advice would you give to a spiritual student or somebody who's on the path to finding their own spirituality? What advice would you give to them? The same advice that my first spiritual teacher, Millie Gordon, gave to me. Walk the spiritual path with practical feet. Can you describe for us for how it feels for you when spirit is near? Yeah, well, there's a shift in the energy. First of all, my mediumship is in my hands. I know that. Because it's spirit deals with energy. And that's how they come through to you in that way. And often when you're overshadowed by a spirit, people who are 
in a room, if you're sitting in a dimly lit room, often can see the person transfigured, and they can actually see the guide, the spirit overshadowing the medium. That happens a lot, especially if people have the sight and they can't see spirit. You mentioned earlier about guardian angels. Do you think everybody has a guardian angel? As to the best of my knowledge and belief, yes. Everybody does have a guardian angel. But, you know, they don't interfere in our lives. I mean, your guardian angel is there to watch over you. But we have free will. Man was gifted with free will. It's a gift from the Creator, from the Eternal One. And we all have free will to make our own choices in life. So sometimes, even if you're spirit guides, you think that they're there to help you, and they are. Um, but they will guide you. But they don't take over your life. And sometimes they just have to stand by and let you make your own mistakes. And that's how we learn. Because remember, I believe that this is a reform school. This is where we come to learn. I wonder if you would like to comment about all the talk and all the predictions and all the revelations about December 21st, 2012. Uh, you mean the end of the Mayan calendar, as we know it. Y my comment will be, I will see you on December 22nd, 2012. Joey, you talk in your book about some of your personal heroes in life, St. Francis of Assisi, and singer Joni James, and, and icon film actress Susan Hayward. Um, can you tell me what what... What did they mean to you, and, and how did they help you on your path and in your struggles? Well, St. Francis, of course, inspires me, always has, and I always related to him. I, I have in my possession his relic, was given to me as a gift. Uh, Miss James I met when I was 14 years old in Montreal. She was my favorite singer. She was appearing at the Seville Theater in Montreal, and I remember sitting uh, in the fourth row of the theater, and she started to sing. Her big hit at the time was How Important Can It Be? And she started to cry. And of course, I started to cry. So I became a fan for life and started her fan club in Montreal and went on through years, and I've had the privilege of knowing Joni personally now for almost, well, 50 years near, near on. So it's been a long time that she's been a part of my life. and. Uh, I've always found her voice very soothing for me because of her pure tones and her angelic voice. And of course, nobody could sing a love song like Joni James. So, and I am a hopeless romantic. And so she soothed my broken heart many a time during my life. So um, that's a very strong contact that I have with Joni. And I'm happy to say that she's a close personal friend, which was, Nice for me to meet one of my idols in person. Susan Hayward I first saw in 1952 uh, and with a song on my heart when she played Jane Froman and I fell in love with her. I loved uh, her gutsy, gutsy approach to life and then I made it my business to read about her. And of course she was from Brooklyn and grew up in the school of hard knocks. Um, to my, in my personal opinion, because I've been a fan for years and still am, she's still my favorite actress. And I do think and do believe that she was the best American actress ever, as far as I'm concerned. Um, her roles, I loved her feistiness. And so when I was trying to deal with my own uh, personality and growing up, I mean, I'd go and see her movies, and I got some great lines from I'll Cry Tomorrow, I'll tell you that, and I would use them. So it, to me, she just inspired me, and uh, I just liked her. and. and uh, still do to this day. They're my heroes. Do you think it's important to have a sense of humor when you're on the spiritual path? I think it's important to have a sense of humor in life and especially on the spiritual path not to take yourself too seriously. Be serious about your spiritual devotion and your spiritual development but yes lighten up have a sense of humor because you know uh, I'm sure the Creator put us here that he has a greatest sense of humor at all when you see some of the antics that we get up to. Do you think it's important for young people to have heroes to look up to? Yes, I do. I think that role models are very, very important. 
and I think that they, um, you know, some of them are great. I mean, look at some of the celebrities that are around these days, the, the work that they do, the ones that use their celebrity to benefit other less fortunate people, people like George Clooney and Brad Pitt and so on. Um, they, I'm sure a lot of them do very, very good work. And I think that they, in a sense, become uh, role models and icons. I think people always need somebody to look up to. That sounds like a cliche song, and it is a line from the song, but there you have it. Why do you think people seek out mediums and psychics? Well, I think most people go, uh, they're looking for some, con they're looking for answers. People are always looking for answers. And, and a lot of people come to mediums, or come to me, uh, because they're trying to contact someone who has passed on or they need some guidance in their lives. And so they're, they're looking uh, for answers that sometimes they cannot find within themselves. And some people just do it because they like doing it, which to me is very stupid. Um, so you should take responsibility for your own life. Um, and I think it, it behooves the mediums and the psychics not to allow people to depend, to build a dependency upon them, like to go and see their psychic every week and all this to me is absolute nonsense, in my humble opinion. Do you have any thoughts or insight for us on, on what is happening and evolving in the world today? I mean, we are, we're going through a really tough time right now, and there's a lot about the, the light and the darkness, and what well, do you think? Well, I think, personally, my belief, in my opinion, um, that there is a struggle going on on the planet between the light and the dark, that there is a battle for people's minds and souls. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting, though, that people are becoming really, really aware of one word, and that word is greed. And I think it's really good that they are, because there's people en masse. You know, a, a lot of people are not conscious. They walk through life like sleepwalkers, and a lot of people do not want to think for themselves, but they're starting to get it. And contrary to what the PR says, that greed is good, greed ain't good. And I think that people are starting to get that sense of it that uh, there are certain, certain elements of people uh, control everything and have all the wealth and so on and so forth. And they're starting to think, well, how did they get that way? And maybe it'll give people pause for concern and bring their attention that, hey, we have to focus on other things on the planet, like maybe trying to save the planet in any way that we can. In a sense, I'm referring to global warming. You have some wonderful prayers and poems in your book. Uh, do you have a favorite? And, and if so, why is it your favorite? One that I like, and St. Francis used to use it all the time, but it's, actually, it's from the Bible, and it's from Numbers from number 6, and it's just a blessing. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord turn his countenance to thee and give thee peace. I love that. I think in its utter simplicity. And I love the Lord's Prayer in Latin. I like the Pater Noster. And I say the rosary quite frequently. For a lapsed Catholic, that might surprise people, but I do. And do you think prayer helps? I believe that it does. That's my personal opinion, yes. Yeah, I do. I believe prayer works. And I believe that it's heard. I don't think any prayer goes unanswered. It may not, you know, on the earth plane, we're governed by the three C's, calendars, clocks, and currency. And maybe these days, celebrity, who knows. But I do believe that any prayer that is uttered is heard and acted upon. We have to understand that God's time is not our time, and we may not get the answers that we want right away. And you know, we're, we're of a generation that uh, we want it right now, instant communication, instant messages. Well, you know, forget about it. Man proposes, God disposes. So just be patient. And that's a lesson that I have to learn because I am not a patient person. Well, we're coming to the closing. The and, end of the chapter. And I wonder if you would like to leave us with a prayer or your personal philosophy or vision for the future. 
Well, I'm just going to go right back to Socrates. So my, my comment would be, what I'll leave people with, is know thyself. And that goes back to the ancient times. And then you can quote Shakespeare on the same thing, saying, till thine own self be true. Just be true to yourself. Don't deny your own experiences when you're dealing with spiritual matters. And just know that you are a spirit with a body and you carry that light within yourself, that you are the light. We all are the light. That's very important. We cannot forget that. We've come to the end. Thank you so much for being with us today. The pleasure is mine, and thank you. <laughs>